we are nearly there. Tomorrow is the coronation and after 28 videos I think I'm nearly finished too. Tomorrow I will release a 10 minute video on what to expect on the day and then in the evening there will be another video um, discussing everything that we have seen in the ceremony. But before that in this video I'm going to look at the final elements of the coronation ceremony itself, the enthroning and then the homage which take place directly after the crowning. While he is still seated in St Edward's chair, the Sovereign receives a solemn blessing. Traditionally, this is performed by the Archbishop of Canterbury alone, but this year it will be an ecumenical blessing. The Archbishop will begin it and end it, but Nikitis, the Greek Orthodox Archbishop of Theotira and Great Britain, the moderator of the Free Churches, the Secretary General of the Churches Together in England and Wales, Cardinal Vincent Nichols, the Catholic Archbishop of Westminster, will also say some words during the blessing. Then the king, still wearing all his robes, his crown, and holding the scepters, will move in procession to his throne in the coronation theatre under the central tower of the abbey. Traditionally, he moves in procession to the throne with the great officers of state and the peers who carry the swords and the sort of offering born before him, with the Archbishop of Canterbury and other prominent bishops also walking ahead of the king too. We don't know as yet who will be involved in this part of the ritual on Saturday. You may have seen my earlier video on the throne and what makes a throne a throne, and that is raising a chair on steps. Now we know that the king is going to be using the throne chair that was made for his grandfather in 1937. Hopefully that throne chair will be raised up, as at previous coronations, since the 14th century at least, on a raised platform. It is often said that this little platform erected in Westminster Abbey, which looks like a mound, represents the mounds of earth that Saxon kings were enthroned upon. Certainly there was a tradition in the long distant past of kings being elected and inaugurated at meetings called moots that often took place on little hills. The court of Tynwald, what is effectively the parliament of the Isle of Man, in early times met on such a hill and on it the lords of Man were proclaimed. This little hill is still used once a year. And the Scottish kings when crowned at Scone on the Stone of Destiny, which of course will be under St Edward's chair on Saturday, were crowned on a little hill called Moot Hill. But my view is that the raised throne in Westminster Abbey has really nothing to do with this, but is rather a copy of Frankish and later French practice. The throne of Charlemagne at Aachen is raised on five steps. The French kings, until the Revolution, were enthroned upon the stone rood screen that separated the nave and chancel of Reims Cathedral. There is a wonderful engraving uh, showing the coronation of Louis XV in 1722 that shows his canopied throne on the rood screen accessed via a vast flight of steps. He sat there after his crowning facing the altar for the rest of the coronation ceremony. The Liber Regalis of the 14th century includes instructions for a stage to be constructed under the crossing of Westminster Abbey on which a lofty throne is to be placed. It was to have steps from the west and steps from the east. There is an illumination in a copy of Foissart's Chronicles, now in the Harley Collection in the British Library, that shows Henry IV's coronation. It shows the moment of enthroning, with the king seated on the throne on such a raised platform, reached by five steps from the east. And it is clearly shown under the crossing tower of the church in what is now the Coronation Theatre. The purpose of the lofty throne, the Liber Regalis states, is so that the king can be clearly seen by his people when he is enthroned. Once he has reached his throne, the king is physically lifted into it by the assembled bishops and nobles, and his kingdom is bestowed upon him with their consent. They then arrange themselves around him on the steps leading to the throne. Once enthroned, the Archbishop of Canterbury then addresses the king in words that are taken directly from the coronation service of King Edgar at Bath in 973. The words were written by St Dunstan, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury. They are words of encouragement for the king and are rather moving. 
Stand firm and hold fast from henceforth this seat of royal dignity, which is yours by the authority of Almighty God. May that same God whose throne endures forever establish your throne in righteousness, that it may stand fast forevermore. So having been hallowed and crowned, the king is now in possession of the kingdom that is his birthright. After the enthroning, for many centuries, was performed a ritual that is the latest introduction to the coronation rite. It isn't really an important part of it at all. It is essentially a secular rather than a spiritual ceremony, and that is the homage. It didn't exist at all in the earliest texts of the coronation because it's essentially a feudal practice and England did not have a feudal system before it was introduced at the Norman Conquest. The Norman feudal principle is that all land is owned by the king and that everyone else is a vassal. They hold their land through the king's goodwill and land was bestowed on people in return for military or other service. Kings would have important vassals called tenants-in-chief, and then the tenants-in-chief would have vassals of their own. The ceremony of homage, which we have in the coronation, was one of the rituals that oiled the wheels of the feudal system at all levels. An act of homage was an acknowledgement by a lord and his vassal of the bond that existed between them. When the homage was first introduced into the coronation, it was a commonplace act at all levels of society. It was an action in in this case in which the relationship between the new king and his tenants-in-chief was worked out and the expectations of both made clear. Those tenants-in-chief in time became, of course, the barons, the great nobles who in time became the peers of the realm. The feudal ceremony of homage involves two actions. The act of homage itself requires the vassal to kneel before their lord and make themselves subject to him by placing their hands within the lord's hands. Then, the second action is they swear an oath of fealty, faithfulness to the Lord. The whole procedure was a recognition of both the assistance owed by the vassal to his Lord and the protection owed by the Lord to the vassal, which is symbolised by the Lord's hands encompassing the hands of the vassal. Both of those elements, the homage and the swearing of fealty, are present traditionally in the homage ceremony in the coronation. The peers kneel and they place their hand within the king's hands and then swear an oath. The homage of the nobles to the king wasn't initially part of the coronation at all, but took place after it. The homage and swearing of fealty to Richard I took place two days after the coronation, but sometime between the end of the 12th century and the beginning of the 14th century, the ritual was then introduced into the coronation ceremony. There were not that many nobles in the 14th century and they all paid homage and swore fealty individually. In the little device which describes the coronation of Henry VII in October 1485, all the bishops, who remember were members of the House of Lords, um, swear uh, fealty first and then the temple, the secular peers, swear their fealty, and they all do it individually. The bishops swore to be faithful and true to the new sovereign. The temple peers were to swear the following oath. I become your liege man of life and limb and of earthly worship, and in faith and truth shall bear unto you to live and die for you against all manner of folk. So help me God. When Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, knelt before his wife, Queen Elizabeth II, in 1953 to pay his homage, he used those very 15th century words, entirely unchanged. As the peerage grew in size in the 17th century, it became increasingly impractical for the hundreds of peers present at the coronation to pay their homage individually. For the coronation of James II onwards, Only one peer of each degree would pay homage. The Archbishop of Canterbury and the Bishop's Assistant paid homage to the King while all the other bishops knelt. Then the Princes of the Blood Royal, having removed their coronets, made their homage, followed by a representative peer from each degree of the nobility in order of rank. Dukes, Marquises, Earls, Viscounts and Barons. The other nobles 
of each of these degrees knelt in their place with their coronets removed. This feudal survivor continued until the coronation of 1953. It is extraordinary that it actually survived the Middle Ages. The feudal system collapsed in the mid-14th century after the Black Death, and in all other contexts except in the coronation ceremony, vassals gradually stopped offering their homage and swearing fealty as forms of feudal tenure disappeared. So reform is long overdue. In the 70 years since the last coronation, a lot has changed. Since 1998, the hereditary peers, those who inherited their noble titles, are simply a small elected rump within the House of Lords, which is mostly made up of life peers appointed by politicians. The decision has been made this year to rethink the homage. The bishops will still swear their fealty to the king. He is, after all, the supreme governor of the Church of England, and Church of England ministers all routinely swear an oath of allegiance to the sovereign when appointed to their offices. The princes of the blood are simply going to be represented by the Prince of Wales. And those words, first formulated for the homage in the 15th century, have been dropped in exchange for this simplified formula. I, William, Prince of Wales, pledge my loyalty to you, and faith and truth I will bear unto you, as your liege man of life and limb, so help me God. It sounds like an oath in court. It doesn't really have the same power or character as the colourful language of the previous formula, promising to live and die for the sovereign against all folk, all people. The biggest part of the reform is that the homage of the peers has been completely dropped. No surprise there. What it has been replaced with is a wholly tone-deaf attempt to democratise this part of the ceremony. Sadly, you cannot democratise something that isn't democratic in character. Even in 1953, the homage was a feudal transaction between a sovereign as overlord and their tenant-in-chief, and was anachronistic. In giving their homage, the peers knew at least that they would receive something in return, or had received something in return from the crown. They owed their wealth, or their family owed their wealth and their political position, to their relationship or their former relationship with the crown. Their coronets indicated that they were little kings, that they were vice-regents. But this year, the Archbishop of Canterbury will invite everyone to join in what is being termed the homage of the people. He will say, I call upon all persons of goodwill of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and of the other realms and the territories to make their homage in heart and voice to their undoubted king, defender of all. All who so desire, both in the Abbey and elsewhere, those watching their televisions at home, are invited to say together, I swear that I will pay true allegiance to your majesty and to your heirs and successors according to law, so help me God. Now, people will enjoy the coronation. People love a spectacle. But part of the enjoyment is that it has never demanded anything of them. Whether you think it's a fabulous spectacle or not, or as I do, a solemn spiritual service, People will enjoy just observing it. However, I can't see people in general being all that comfortable swearing a form of feudal fealty to a king in the 21st century. I know it's optional, but it demands of people in general something that has never been demanded of them before at the time of a coronation. I'm a traditionalist, and I'm very supportive both of our monarchy And I, King, and I believe in the importance of ritual, otherwise I wouldn't bother recording all these videos about the coronation. Um, I would have a full-fat coronation with no deviation from the 1953 format if I was the person in charge of the world. Um, I'd have 8,000 people crammed into the abbey and there would be lots of robes and coronets aplenty. It might have been simpler to drop the homage entirely rather than asking everyone to swear deferential feudal fealty with nothing in return except perhaps a smile and a nod from the king. I think this decision really plays into the hands of republican elements within the country at large. As I've demonstrated, 
The homage is quite a late introduction into the ritual of the coronation ceremony, and it is one element that is not a necessity in the rite of the hallowing of the king. You don't get me expressing my opinion on here very often, but I think it would have been preferable if the homage had been removed entirely, rather than crudely democratised. Thanks very much for watching. I've decided to publish a special coronation issue of the Antiquary magazine. This is an addition to the general monthly issue. I have a large collection of really interesting old photographs that I've been collecting over the years of the coronations of George V, George VI and Elizabeth II. And to celebrate the King's coronation in May, this issue will be a special album looking back at the coronations of the 20th century. There is a link in the description and above to the website where you can pre-order a copy before the publishing date in early May.